uneven and combined development is a social theory of the international. It was first produced by the Russian Marxist revolutionary, Leon Trotsky, who wrote about it in a series of writings between about 1905 and, and the mid-1930s. But Trotsky mainly applied it naturally to his own experience uh, in the run-up to the, the Russian Revolution and, and the consequences of, of that. And he never really worked it out fully as a social theory. And that's what's happening today in the field of international studies, where several writers are trying to follow through the intellectual implications of this idea that, that Trotsky had. Now, when I say that this is a, a social theory of the international, I mean that it, it provides essentially three things. First, it provides an explanation for why the international exists in the first place as a dimension of the social world. You know, why are there many societies instead of just one? Secondly, it provides what you could call a, a sociology of the causal mechanisms that result from the existence of the international so that you can see the effects or the, the significance or the role that the international plays in human history. And finally, it provides an understanding of how international relations themselves are part of a wider historical uh, whole that Trotsky called the social structure of humanity. I can't think of any other theory in international studies that provides all of that. And the reason that I call it a social theory of the international is because it, it derives all these points from one basic assumption or claim that it makes about the nature of, of human development. And that is the claim that development has always been uneven. Now, what Trotsky meant by this, by saying that the development is always uneven, is that there's never been a time when human history has not been made up of a, a multiplicity of a number of, of human societies. There's never been a time when there's just been one human society. There have always been multiple societies coexisting. Societies um, of different sizes, different levels of development, um, different cultures, different social structures, and so on. Now, from that very uh, commonsensical claim that, that there have always, there's never been a, a situation where the world was just made up of, of one society, something very significant follows, and this is the second assumption of the theory, which is that these societies have always had an outside world to deal with. Sometimes it could be that other societies pose a military threat to them and force them to alter their development in some way in order to, to cope with that. But on the other hand, it could be that other societies have developed ideas or have access to resources that enable your society to develop in a, in a whole new way. But either way, interaction has always been a key dimension of social development. If we ask who are the leading actors in international relations according to this approach? It's clear at the outset that states have a central role to play. And that's partly because states in the developed world have an interest in supporting their own capitalist employers and investors in expanding the spread of, of the world market to maximize uh, profits. But it's also because states in what we now call the Global South have a powerful interest in responding to the challenge of late development by intervening in their own societies in order to stimulate industrialization. However, the more you look at Trotsky's writings about uneven and combined development, the more really you would have to say that it's entire societies that are, if you like, the, the leading actors in this process because it is the, it's the different location of each society within a wider historical process that confronts actors within those societies with the challenge that they have to respond to. And the people that have to respond are n not only the states and the businessmen, 
but also, of course, the, the intellectuals and the political parties who debate you know, what is the best solution to the problems that a, a given society faces. And also, of course, the, the working classes and the peasantry who are the object of developmental policies, often very coercive developmental policies, and who react uh, by struggling against exploitation and oppression in various ways. In fact, in, in Trotsky's account, of course, the peasantry and, and the working class came to have a leading role in the outcome of Russia's combined development, namely uh, the Bolshevik Revolution itself. Trotsky himself believed that the major source of conflict in international affairs was the capitalist nature of modern societies, and that it was the, the ruthless competition that their social structures forced them to undertake in relation to each other that was the source of conflict and war. And he also anticipated that there would be a massive uh, cooperative process in the transition to socialism and beyond. Now I think when you th think carefully about the theory of uneven and combined development, it's not clear that its implications are as straightforward as that, or as, if you like, as, as optimistic as that. After all, un the unevenness of development was a feature of historical change long before capitalism emerged, and presumably it would continue into the post-capitalist period as well. And so far as the contemporary period is concerned, where we're still in, in a capitalist world, I think the main implication is that possibilities of or arrangements for uh, enduring cooperation in international affairs are bound to be of a short-lived nature for the simple reason that the unevenness of historical development and change is continually producing new world powers and relative decline among existing ones and hence redistributions of power in the world that need to be to be adjusted to and so on. So whether that means that in the short run there will be conflict, war or peace, I think is entirely a question of what the particular social structure of humanity is at the moment and how well those in, pos in policy positions manage to negotiate it. As we know, realism takes as its starting point for explaining international affairs the interaction of multiple states and the security dilemmas that that creates for them. Liberalism, and Marxism as well for that matter, take as their starting point the particular nature of modern liberal society and its implications for transforming the nature of, of international politics. I think the real difference between those two and uneven and combined development is that whereas the realist account in effect says that the nature of the societies involved makes absolutely no difference to what's really going on here. This is simply the struggle for power between states. It's always been like this throughout human history and always will be, and that's in effect all there is to it. There is no real social content to it. Whereas uneven and combined development shows you that these international uh, conflicts and, and processes of, of development are in fact part of a much wider transformation of, of human existence that we're all caught up with in the modern period. Now, liberalism and Marxism are of course very alive to th the idea that the modern international system is, is something special and, and different from earlier historical periods. But for them, the argument is entirely about how liberalism or capitalist society changes international relations, and almost not at all about the significance of the international for how liberal society or capitalism will develop as a world system. And there again, I think there's a, a key difference, which is that uneven and combined development pinpoints the significance of this enduring feature of historical development and change, the international, for capitalism as a as a form of society. Get more from the Open University. Check out the links on screen now.